Hey guys, it's Matt with the YouTube channel Belief in Jeep. Today I want to talk to you about Roll Cage Design 101. So when I first started with the Scorpion Crawler Project, I really had no idea how to build a roll cage, but I learned a lot on the way. And today I want to teach you everything that I learned. But first, if you haven't been with us before, make sure to subscribe to our channel. We have all the best off-road content, none of the boring stuff. Let's jump right into it. Okay, there's three things we need to get out of the way first. Roll cage design depends on your specific sport. If you are racing NASCAR at 200 miles an hour, your roll cage is going to need to be designed much differently than if you're crawling three miles an hour over some rocks. If you intend on ever doing any racing with this rig that you are building, get a score book, S-C-O-R-E. It's going to tell you all of the specifications. Also, if you're going to be doing racing, make sure to check into your particular racing guidelines. Each sport is going to have their own set of specifications for how you need to build your roll cage. And number three, don't build a roll cage just to protect the body. That's not a roll cage. A roll cage is designed to protect the occupants inside and keep them safe. So the next thing we need to talk about real quick is the tubing choices. Right here we've got two choices. One is welded, or sometimes referred to as HREW, and then we've got DOM. Now how can you tell the difference? Well, the welded, you can see there's a weld seam on the inside, whereas the DOM, or the drawn over mandrel, does not have that weld seam on the inside. Now these are treated differently. This one is much, much stronger, probably about two times as strong as the welded tube. Now there's also one other that you can use called chromoly, and it's even stronger than the DOM, but if you're watching this video, you're probably not to the point where you're going to be needing chromoly tubing. That's more of like a NASCAR uh, or very quick racing application. So which one should you use? Well, if you can afford it, I would suggest DOM. Now there's a lot of debate about which one is better. DOM is known to take a high stress impact without bending but it will break. The welded tubing, on the other hand, will bend before it'll break. So if you are familiar with newer cars, they have what's called crumple zones, and they want the car to bend to absorb the impact. With our rock crawlers, um, you really aren't going fast enough to want a crumple zone to absorb that impact on, in most cases. So I would say go with DOM if you can afford it. Now. On my buggy, I put DOM on the outside, anywhere that's going to take an impact. And to save money, to save cost, I put welded on the inside where it's never going to get hit by a rock. But the one thing that you probably shouldn't do, and I think most people will agree, is build your roll cage with Schedule 40 pipe or anything other than tubing. All right, so the next thing we need to talk about is tubing size. So the standard tubing size that you would use in an automotive application like this is inch and three quarter 120 wall. So what does that mean? Well, inch and three quarter, that's the outside diameter of the tubing. And 120 wall, that means it's 0 0.120 of an inch if you measure it, or about an eighth of an inch. So that is the standard for what we do rock crawling. Now if you're going to be doing something crazy, like if you have a big heavy rock bouncer, they might use a 2 inch 120 wall. And if you've got a real light duty razor you're just going to be tooling around with, you might use something like inch and a half .095 wall. If you're just going to be making a roof rack or something, you can use real light gauge uh, small tubing. I think this is an inch. And then for something like links, I used this on my lower links. This is, I believe, two inch quarter wall. Now that we're done with that, we can move on to the design aspect of the cage. Now I'm not an expert at all, so I need to make that clear. I did do a lot of research, and one of the great articles I found was on Pirate 4x4. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Number one, triangles are stronger than squares. There's a reason that whenever you look at a bridge, a building, a house, they're made out of triangles, and that's because triangles are strong. Check this out. 
I've got all my body weight on there and I can't even budge that. Now let's do the same thing with the square. Doesn't even compare. I just squished it. So when you're designing your cage you want to keep triangles in mind. When I first came up with this concept I put it in Photoshop and I drew out the cage the way I wanted it. I showed it to a friend and he was like mmm that's not gonna work. And the reason is I had all these fancy curves that looked really cool but I didn't use triangulation. So I went back to the drawing board I tried to make it look as cool as I could still, but I put triangles everywhere. You can see triangle here, triangle here, triangle here, triangle here. And all that makes it much, much stronger than if you were to do some fancy S-curves. Number two is to avoid bends wherever possible. So on my original design, I had a bend right here so that I could get in and out easier. But what's going to happen if I have a bend right there, and I have a severe impact from the front. All that is going to get transferred and just make the bend even more. Now I've got a straight tube. That impact is going to push its way back. It's not going to bend the tube because there's no bends in it. It's just going to push and push and push and it will be much stronger than if I were to just put a bend right there. But if you do have to have a bend, you want to support the bend. So you can see right here I've got a bend, but I've also got it supported. I've got a bend also on the front down here, but it attaches here to the front as well. And I've got a bend right here in this tube, but it's supported here and here. So if you have a bend and then you have a support coming into it, it's going to be much stronger than if you just had a straight bend like this and you had an impact, it would just fold that up. But now I've got this bend right here and I've got it supported here here and here, it's not really going to be able to go anywhere. You've also seen people do this on their shock hoops. Mine's a little bit different, but if you have a shock hoop coming up and you've got your shock attached to that hoop, you support it and go across to the other shock hoop, which gives it much more support. That way it's not just going to fold in whenever you hit a hard bump. Number three, you should never end a tube perpendicular with another tube. If you're going to do this, you need to do this. You can see what I mean right here. This tube comes, it impacts with this tube, but then it also keeps going. It actually goes all the way to the back and around the other side. If I were to just have a tube coming in right here to this tube and not have this secondary tube, what happens if I get an impact from the front? All it would do is shove this tube back and bend this tube in. Let me give you a quick example. I've got this tube supported here and here and this one just tees right into it. What happens if we take an impact? All it's going to do is shove that tube and bend it. So whenever you have a situation like this, you always should follow through with another piece of tubing and connect that somewhere else. Let's look at a real life example. Take this tube for instance. I didn't really want this tube right here because if I come sliding off of a tree, it's going to grab right there. But I had to have it because if I didn't, let's say this tube just came in and ended right there. What would happen if I were to land on my roof? This tube would just shove down and the whole top would collapse. So instead of just ending it there, you take it, you bring it all the way down, and then at the bottom here it goes down inward towards the frame, makes it much stronger. Number four is to add corner gussets whenever you have a T. So you can buy triangular corner gussets like these. These come from Trade West Fabrication and they just weld in place like this. They make that joint stronger. An alternative is to just take a piece of tubing and notch it. So you're going to make a little A shape like that. And what that does is just add triangulation to this otherwise square 90 degree piece and give it that much more strength. So I added corner gussets in a few places, but namely right here over your head in what would otherwise be just a square 90 degree junction. Number five, try and keep your A and B pillars as vertical as possible. The more you lean them back, the more they'll want to just fold in. So that brings us to what is A, B, C, and D pillars. You might have heard this term before. It's really simple. This is your A pillar. Anything that goes up over your head, these are your pillars. This is the first one, A, B, C, and D. 
So with the Cherokee, I don't have much choice. The A pillar is already leaned back, but it does make it weaker. So if I took a really hard hit right here, it does have the potential to fold in. Now you can correct for that by taking a bar and coming from here to here, but that brings us to point number six, which is ingress and egress. And that means getting in and out. I could put a bar right here and make it very stable, but then how am I going to get out in case of a rollover? Let's say I have a rollover and there's a fire. You need to be able to get out quickly. Number seven, the inverted V is the best type of windshield spreader that you can have. And it comes down to our triangle again. So let's take our triangle example. Imagine that you rolled over hard and you came down on your top. That pressure is going to spread down to these two posts and spread it in two. It's going to spread it and give half the force. So it's going to put that pressure into two different spots. Let's say you had uh, not an inverted V but a regular V like this instead. If that were to happen you would take a hard impact and it would take that and multiply it down into this one point. So you'd have all that pressure going into one point instead of going into two points. So that's why the inverted V is the best type of windshield spreader if you're going to go with one of those. Number eight, your B hoop, so that's the one right above your head, should have an X in it. And the reason is your B hoop is essentially just a square. Remember our square from earlier? And that's not strong. But by putting an X in the middle of it, you've just created four triangles. Super strong. So you need an X. I had to get creative with mine to give room for the extra passengers in the back here, but it's still pretty much an X. And then you need to have a seat belt harness bar also. And that transitions nicely into point number nine. Your shoulder harness bar should be in line, level, with your shoulders. The reason is, if it's too high, you flip over, you're going to come out of your seat belt. It's going to have too much wiggle room. If it's too low and you get in a crash, when you crash forward, the belt is going to pull you down and compress your spine. So the top of this bar needs to be about where your shoulders are going to be. Number 10. Sometimes you'll get into a situation like this where you have multiple tubes all coming together. It's very tempting because you're going to have to fit them beforehand. It's very tempting to just leave them in there and then weld them all together. But what you really need to do is go ahead and weld the first two first and then bring these in and weld them second. That way you get good penetration. If you were to weld all of it together at once, you wouldn't get this weld in here and this weld and this weld and this weld. It would be much weaker. So go ahead and weld those first and then go ahead and do the extra coping or whatever you need to fit the next tubes in and then weld those in and on and on. Number 11. All of your tubes should come down and attach to the frame or at the very least you should have, if you're attaching to the body, you should sandwich two plates together. So you'd have your tube coming down welded to a plate, have some holes bolted in it, and then th that going through the body and another plate on the bottom of the body. That I don't think is as strong though, and it's probably the secondary option, but the best option is to come all the way down to the frame, weld to the frame. Number 12. If welding to the frame, consider a landing plate to increase weld area and strength. So if you're going to weld something to your frame, if you just take the tube and you weld it to the thin frame, it's going to break and crack over time. There's a lot of stresses acting on that, and you've only got about three inches of weld area there. But if you take a thicker plate, you weld the tube to that, you know that's going to be strong because this is thick. Now, look how much more surface area you have to weld than if we just welded this. You probably get about five times as much weld area, and that will make the whole thing much stronger. Number 13, attach the seats and the seat belts to the cage, not the tub. Sometimes the tub is prone to rust, it can fall apart. Imagine if you are in a Wrangler and you've got this big heavy cage and it's welded to the frame and all of a sudden the tub decides to come loose while you're upside down. You're just going to get squished inside there. So make sure that everything is securely fastened to the roll cage. Number 14 is headroom. 
I've got this X brace across the top here which makes it stronger and safer. If I were to roll over and hit a boulder right here it won't crush down into my head. But at the same time you don't want to be smacking your head as you're barrel rolling down a hill. So make sure that when you're strapped in your harness you still can't contact your head in any direction while you're strapped in. Most racing bodies will have a minimum clearance distance that you need to follow when building your rig if you're going to be doing racing. And number 15 is to consider what would happen if you were to pass out during a barrel roll. You've probably seen those nets on racing rigs and Baja vehicles. Those aren't just for cool factor, that is to keep you inside the vehicle during a barrel roll. So if you were to pass out or if you just experience high G's, what's going to happen to your arms and legs? It's not as important on a slow rock crawling rig like this, but definitely something to consider. Number 16. It doesn't matter how good you are, eventually you're going to need to splice two tubes together. Whether you made a mistake, whether you need a longer tube, or if you just wrecked and you need to replace a section. But instead of just butting these together and welding them, you need to do something special. What you need to do is sleeve and rosette weld your tube. So what you do is you find another tube that fits right inside of here. You drill holes. I like to drill four. You need to drill these pretty large so that your welds will penetrate. You slide this other tube inside of here. You do the same thing on the other side. Of course you need to drill the other tube as well, but you also need to bevel the edge. Once you do that and you weld the whole thing together, it'll be even stronger than the original tube. Now if you don't want to make your own, TMR Customs makes a solid sleeve that's even stronger than the one I've set up here. Okay, number 17, and this is the last one, is to try and visualize impacts and where the stresses will travel. So take for instance this tube right here. Let's say I were to take a heavy impact and a rollover and it would hit right here on a rock or something. <clears throat> if I didn't have this tube right here, it's possible, you can visualize this, that this tube right here would just bend right here and it would bend the entire top or tweak the entire top over. But since I have this tube here, it braces that and makes a V, just like on the windshield, it spreads that evenly. So if you were to take a high heavy impact right here, it would spread that down these two tubes and this one would go this way. This one would come down here, stresses would come down here, it would spread it even more down here to these two tubes and then it would go down to the frame. Let's take a look at this section right here. I've got a triangle here, triangle here, great for frontal impacts, but if I were to take a side hit right here on a rock or something real hard, it could just bend this section in. What I could do to correct that is to have a tube go from here to here. I needed the seat belt harness to be up here, but I could have added a tube from here to here, but you have to consider when is too much too much. If I start adding tubes everywhere, yeah, it'll be really strong and safe, but it'll also be really heavy. So what you need to keep in mind is building the minimum cage for your sport to keep you safe. Here's a great example of where I think I could have improved this cage. I took a hard hit right here and right here. It dented the tubing, in fact. And when it did that, it pushed this whole section in, probably a quarter inch or half inch, and it bent the dash, you can see right here. What I could have done to protect that, hindsight is 2020, right? But what I could have done is had a bar come from somewhere in here and go straight across to the other side. That would have added protection and kept this from ben bending in. Alright guys, thanks for watching. Now remember, there is no perfect way to build a cage. What was acceptable 10 years ago in NASCAR, they're probably looking back saying, what in the world were we thinking? So when it really comes down to it, you're in charge of your own safety. So you need to make sure that you build it right, build it the best of your ability. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and check out the website bleepinjeep.com. We do new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So uh, I hope to see you next time. Hey guys, if this video was helpful to you, please consider joining our Patreon page. Patreon is a place where you can make a monthly contribution to help support the channel. It's 
patreon.com slash bleepin'g. What we do there is offer extra content, and I also send out special perks, t-shirts, stickers, all kinds of stuff every month for those of you who are supporting. So check that out, patreon.com slash bleepin'g.